say, I think we're ready to get started. So I just want to say good afternoon to everyone. And I'm really pleased that you're able to join us. My name is Sarah Thompson. Um, the Atlantic Women's Business Series is an initiative of the Atlantic Canadian Women and Growth Partnership Project. It's a three-year project funded by ACOA through the Government of Canada's Women's Entrepreneurship Strategy. It aims to increase the participation of underrepresented groups and sectors in the women's entrepreneurial ecosystem in Atlantic Canada. First of all, I'd like to introduce my mighty team of four in the Atlantic provinces here. Um, we have Rose Fitzpatrick with uh, Prince Edward Island Business Women's Association. Isabel Arsenault is with the Women in Business New Brunswick. Denise Williams is with the Center for Women in Business in Nova Scotia. And again, my name is Sarah Thompson and I am with the Newfoundland and Labrador Organization of Women Entrepreneurs. So welcome everyone to our next installment of the Atlantic Women's Business Series. Today, our discussion is women with disabilities leading the way in entrepreneurship. Did you know that 22% of Canadians are living with at least one disability? And that's according to the Canadian census data from 2016. 22% of Canadians, but 24% of women are living with disabilities in Canada. So we have the, the greater share of uh, disabilities within the population. Um, so people with disabilities are existing and operating in all parts of society, and that's including in business. And I'm really excited to introduce you today to four successful businesswomen from Atlantic Canada, who will share their stories and their perspectives on being an entrepreneur and living with a disability. From Newfoundland and Labrador, I'd like to introduce you to Ashley Sullivan. Ashley is the co-founder and CEO of Skills Hawk. From Nova Scotia, we have Joanne Schmidt, who's the owner of Galloping Cows Fine Foods. Jenna White is with New Brunswick, is, is with New Brunswick, is in New Brunswick. Um, and her company is called Jenna's Nut Free Dessertery. And lastly, Sarah Roach Lewis is in PEI and she's the owner and operator of SRL Solutions. So welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this chat we're going to have um, and the perspectives that you're going to be sharing with us all. So I'm going to start today by just asking you all to introduce yourselves a little bit about yourself and about your business if you would. Um, and perhaps I'll start with you, Ashley. Would you uh, share a bit about yourself and your business? Sure. Um, so just to give a really high level, um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was about two years old. So that kind of took my life on a certain turn. Um, I was born and raised in Grand Falls in central Newfoundland. And I went to Munn uh, first, uh, I did a physics degree. Um, and then I wasn't super excited about teaching, which is kind of like the main thing that everyone thought that you would do with a physics degree. And I didn't really like the theory. So I thought I'd go back and do engineering. Um, between those times, I actually had both hips and both knees replaced. So I'd like to try to say that it took time off, but I don't think it really counted as time off per se. It was a challenging couple of years, but uh, it made a big difference in making it possible for me to actually go back and, and do that second degree. Um, for me, I always, with a disability, you kind of are forced to be an entrepreneur um, because you have to find different ways to do things because it's a no norm ways of doing things just generally don't work. So that's kind of what projected me more to engineering. Um, and then I started my master's uh, in engineering after that, because I found it challenging to get a job, um, which is also, I think, slightly part to the disability too, because a lot of the beginner jobs of, you know, starting from the bottom is a much more physical on-site type job. So I found that a bit more challenging to try to find an entry level job that was going to suit me. Uh, so I started my master's and that is where I met um, my co-founders uh, for the company that we ended up starting. Um, 
our product is called Skills Hawk, and it's our company technically is called Creators Technologies. So I met my two co-founders in a MUN program, actually, we're put together for a project. And I guess our company kind of formed out of there and we decided to make it actually like a real thing. Um, so basically what uh, my software does is it's a SaaS product. So it's a, it's a monthly service type product and it's kind of, it's a skills tracker basically, but it takes, so for people assigning tasks or um, building projects, teams and things like that, a lot of times you either have to go around and ask your employees what they know, or it's who you know and, and who's generally the loudest of what they know. Um, so for our product, basically we take that biasness uh, out of it and it's actually based on task history that's already logged with a company with other project management software that you're using. So it's, it's a much more qualitative, um, unbiased decision-making tool, I guess you could call it. So that way you're not basing it on your opinion of someone or letting biases, which come in unconsciously for everyone, um, or even who you, you know, generally talk to more or anything else that kind of ends up flowing into who gets picked for projects. And it's already quite known that women and minorities um, generally don't uh, project themselves and put themselves up for promotions and and things like that they can kind of feel like our work should speak for itself which it should but it doesn't um, so basically our software in the way that we're trying to kind of make this work for everyone is that it puts everyone on an equal playing field so you're based on your and you're kind of uh, judged I guess on your skill level and not how you do it you know and you know, your abilities that way. So it gives someone the opportunity to shine without having to brag about themselves or, you know, convince someone else that the way they're doing things. It's based on, you know, if I do a good job, it's going to show with the projects I do, with the history that I have, and uh, it helps that way. So I also then halfway through that got a job offer um, from the Department of National Defense. So I ended up leaving my master's. Um, I'm still trying to finish it part time, but Lord knows if that will happen. Uh, I'm trying to find the time, but uh, so actually I work full time during the day with the Department of National Defense in Ottawa. Um, right now I'm working remotely, which is great, but um, normally I work full time with that job and then in the evenings I do this job and whenever I didn't take the time away to, uh, to try to get that done. And I'm also generally involved in a lot of the uh, disability organizations, women organizations, so like ENLO um, and then uh, YZNL. I was quite involved when I was uh, physically in Newfoundland and I'm part of the disability uh, defense group uh, in D&D and, and the Tetris Society. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but if you haven't, check it out. Uh, the Tetris Society of North America is what it's called and you have a fabulous chapter in St. John's, so you should all check that out. But that's just a brief kind of overview of, of who I am. Thank you, Ashley. It sounds like you, you, you're really bored. You don't have a lot. To I would do. love to be bored. <laughs> I miss being bored. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's go to Joanne. Joanne, would you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Sure, uh, I'd be happy to. So um, my company or our company is Galloping Cows Fine Foods. We're located in Port Hood, Cape Breton. It's our business is a family business. Um, we have three generations of women working in our business. My mother works part time and my daughter as well. Um, and uh, like I said, it's a family business. My husband works in it as well. Um, we we produce uh, it's value added products. So uh, we use field grown fruits and vegetables and we take those and we produce product with them. Uh, so we produce pepper jellies, um, jams, uh, chutneys, um, uh, just various products like that. And you'll find our products in Sobeys and um, we're now going into Loblaws as well. Um, having said that, I mean, we've been in business now for 27 years. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, behind that, you know, there's the story of my disability. Um, which happened 16 years ago. Um, so uh, Galloping Cows, we started out on the family farm, uh, which is dairy farm. We, we, Ron and I both have a dairy background. Uh, we were going to go into partnership with my father and um, it didn't work out. Uh, 
So we started a side business um, on the farm. We were growing fruits and vegetables and we, um, that side business grew into galloping cows because we weren't making money um, selling our fruits and vegetables. And we started putting the strawberries into jars of jam and it grew from there. Um, fast forward, you know, a number of years to 16 years ago, um, I had my kids in the vehicle and I'm going to a client to a, actually a large gift store, uh, not too far from here. Crocs were a big thing. Um, it was a sunny, you know, really sunny day. We're going there um, and uh, was checking on the account, but also a big order of Crocs that come in and it was a nice day. Take the kids and we go there. We get the kids their Crocs um, and we're coming back from there and there's this line of construction. And so we pull into the line of construction with the last car. And so I turn off the vehicle, it's a real hot day. And I just look in the mirror and I just catch this car coming, flying, no intention of stopping. Boom, hits us, and that's the last thing I remember. Um, so it's a five car pileup, my seat breaks, I'm the driver, my seat breaks. So I'm bounced around the vehicle. Um, so that's how my head injury happened. So it's a split second on a really nice day. You know, it's not something you see coming in your life. Um, so acquired head injuries are something that you don't plan for in your life. You don't see coming, um, but they change your life entirely. Um, you know, uh, the pressure that happens in your head, um, they decide whether to drill whether to use, you know, rounds of uh, steroids, uh, you know, they make decisions after a while, you land up with teams of doctors in your life and they're in your life forever. Um, so, but what happens is in a small business um, is that everything was in my head for that small business. And unfortunately I lost my memory. I also lost the ability to do math, to write um, and to read. And so I had to learn a lot of these things. And because of that, you know, business, um, we had in some inventory on hand, you know, to fill stores, but um, things became, you know, a complete halt. My husband's like trying to take care of the three of us um, and try to manage some accounts by just sending out inventory to fill things. But you gotta remember everything's in my head and we can't get the processes out of there. Um, and that's the thing that happens to people with head injuries. And the advice is given to you to shut things down, but that's your income, that's your income. And so we decided to keep going and to plod through it and figure it out. And so you fast forward a number of years and your products land up going to the Oscars. You, you know, at the time of the, actually the head injury story, just before that, we got an award for export. We just started exporting. So it was quite a lot of number of years before we were back to, you know, exporting again and everything. You know, we basically virtually lost everything at the time of the head injury. It was so hard to crawl back to where we are now uh, with a federal facility, HACCP, and, you know, uh, to the level of business we are now. But head injuries are debilitating in so many ways to people um, and they're not to be underestimated and they're very common. Um, you know, it can be a car accident like I had, but some people slip, fall, hit their head on a windowsill and can have as dramatic as a head injury where somebody else can have the same injury and not have a head injury. They're very, um, unpredictable is maybe the way to put it, closed head injuries. Um, you know, a lot of people fall downstairs, you know, and they can or may or may not have them. So, um, but, uh, but they are, you live with the consequences the rest of your life, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, somebody else who was driving along, reach over, pick up a piece of paper in their car, steps on the gas while they're doing so, doesn't see a line of traffic ahead of them. And, um, and that's what happens. So, um, but in our business, you know, we're, we're very fortunate, very lucky um, that 
I beat my prognosis um, that, you know, um, over the last 16 years, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, but yet, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to have a very good team of doctors that, you know, I will continuously work with. But our business, um, yeah, you know, um, like I said, it's a, it's a family business and um, we produce great products. So <laughs> that's us. Thanks, Joanne. You've uh, you've certainly been on quite a journey, um, but I'm really uh, I'm, I'm very happy to to see that you guys are, are have been able to keep the business running, and and by all accounts, it seems like the business has been thriving. So um, so uh, that's a testament to you, and it's uh, obviously also a testament to the people around you as well. So, uh, but thank you for for sharing that. Then, uh, would you share a little bit about yourself and uh, your business? Sure. Uh, my name is Jenna White. Uh, my husband and children and I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I started Jenna's Nut Free Dessertery in 2019. We started out really small at a local farmer's market, and we stayed there until the pandemic hit, and that's when things really changed for us. Um, I'm just going to switch topics real quick. Uh, so I am legally blind. This is something that's still relatively new for me. Uh, it was about five years ago now that I lost my eyesight. I have a genetic condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Uh, essentially, all of the soft tissue and collagen in my body are very faulty. So uh, it causes a host of secondary illnesses. So one of those is postural static tachycardia. And essentially all the blood drains from my head and pools in my legs when I stand too long or if I even just stand up sometimes, it just kind of does what it wants. Um, so that happened so many times that the blood drained that it actually damaged the optical nerves in both of my eyes. So one day, basically it was like somebody put a curtain down. So I still have some eyesight. I'm very fortunate in that part. Um, I am just legally blind, not completely blind. People don't really have faces anymore. I can't see very far in front of me at all. Like I'm staring at my computer screen right now. I don't see <laughs> very much. There's some colors. I'm really good with colors. Um, so when that happened, it was a huge change. I had at the time a seven-year-old, a six-year-old, and a five-year-old at home. Uh, there were no doctors here in New Brunswick that could help me. So I got sent to Halifax um, and they did everything they could to try to help and try to reverse some of the damage, but there is no going back, unfortunately. Um, as time goes on, I will probably lose more, which is, it is what it is, right? Um, and then it was really hard to adjust after that uh, because it changes everything. Uh, I was also really, really stubborn at first and pretty bitter and angry um, and didn't really want to accept help from anybody. I still just wanted to do everything myself. I'm an incredibly independent person, so you wouldn't, yeah. So it's very, I'm sure a lot of you can relate when you lose that independence, it can really get you down. Um, but over time, I kind of got used to it and decided I was going to take charge because I was unhappy, right? So um, I had gone to school for business and computer science. Also didn't make me happy. Also not the easiest thing to do when I lost a bunch of my vision. Uh, so I went back to something that I had always wanted, which was baking and cooking. I love to feed people. I always have. I started baking when I was a child with my mom and my grandmas and spent a lot of time in the kitchen. Food was always a huge part of my upbringing and my family. So uh, I decided to try to get into a local farmer's market, um, which I was able to do because we are not free. So right around the time I lost my eyesight, I actually also became allergic to nuts and got anaphylaxis. So that was like a whole other level of losing your eyesight because you have to read the labels on everything you eat. I shouldn't laugh, but it's just, it's one of those things, right? Um, so I used both of those things and decided I was just gonna start my own thing. So I got into the farmer's market. We started with 
two small folding tables from Costco and a menu. I had absolutely zero interest in selling, but it was the only way to get going. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know firsthand, it's really, really hard to get funding for businesses. And when you live with a disability, it seems to be almost even further out of reach. Um, typically, people don't have a whole lot of savings because our job choices are very limited. Um, so we started small and we worked to the viability of the business when we kind of about the year and a half mark it was kind of a you know okay this is going to work um, and then we had the pandemic hit. so we had to kind of switch gears a little bit and so now we have a 3200 square foot space that we fully renovated ourselves uh, we have a commercial kitchen we have a room set up for our flour mill when it comes in because we had to switch gears a little bit. So we had Canada's Smartest Kitchen uh, develop some of our baking mixes or, or our recipes, I suppose, that I use in the bakery. Uh, and we have a whole line of baking mixes that we'll be launching this summer. Uh, it's just a chocolate cake mix, a vanilla cake mix, and bannock in a bag, which is one of my favorites. Um, and we also are going to be milling our own flour in the fall, and then we'll be introducing our pasta lines after that. Um, so since we were already going to have a commercial kitchen for all of those things, we just decided to go for it and we opened, uh, basically it's a little tiny restaurant cafe type thing. We have a breakfast and lunch menu. We have all of our bakery items. Everything's made fresh. I don't believe in preservatives. I don't believe in artificial flavors. I like everything all natural. Um, I don't know if it's got to do with the fact that I'm more aware of my body now that I've gone through everything and I'm trying to keep myself and my children as healthy as possible because anything can happen to anybody at any given point. Um, so we really take that uh, to the extreme here. Uh, we do everything from scratch. We use all local ingredients when we can and we are doing pretty well so far. Um, I mean, there's always room for growth, right? Um, and we also have our own private label coffee made by a local company who was able to guarantee us a nut-free roasting house, which was amazing to find. Um, so we've got a lot going on here. Uh, when I lost my eyesight, I never would have guessed that this is what I would be doing now, but you only live once and you may as well go for it. <laughs> I don't think I would have ever gotten a job in <laughs> being legally blind, but maybe I would have. Who knows, but I know what I need to work efficiently and to make things work for me. So being an entrepreneur just seemed to be the right step forward. Very interesting. I, I'm seeing some common themes already amongst our, our guests here. And, and um, I would say a resourcefulness is one and determination is another. So I'm really curious to hear from you, Sarah. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your business. Uh, sure. So I am a business coach and strategist, and I help women, um, mostly women service-based business owners, grow their business. And we really focus on exponential business growth. So if you're looking to double uh, your business, uh, then that's really what I help people with. And the focus is around, you know, the way to do that is through having good planning. So I do strategy. So what is the plan? What's the big picture of what you want to accomplish within your business? And then what are the steps that you need to take in order to get there? I also see that there are sort of two components to um, ambitiously growing your business. One is the solid plan and the other is a good self-care practice because as small business owners, we are the greatest assets, asset in our business, but we don't always treat ourselves that way. Um, so in terms of a little bit of my background, you know, it's interesting when I was asked to join this panel, um, I was really excited and honored and then had a massive crisis of confidence. Um, am I disabled? Am, am I Am I disabled enough to speak on a panel about disability? Um, I see Jenna nodding. Um, so I have Meniere's disease, which is an imbalance of the fluid in, inner, in the inner ear. I've had it uh, since I was probably 15. 
And I had a blissful period when my kids were little, like 10 years, I forgot I had it. Uh, 10 years where I had no episodes at all, but when it is episodic, it causes dizzy spells, um, hearing loss, as well as super sensitive hearing to certain tones um, and ringing in the ear. General misery is kind of the way I, I describe it. And as a result of that, um, I have significant hearing loss in my left ear. I'm really lucky uh, that, I, that I only have this in one ear, um, but that's really what my, that experience has been like. I've, um, I ran, I started my business before I started my business. I, I've been in business for about four years. Before that, I worked for um, a feminist organization for much of my career. I spent most of my career in the not-for-profit sector. And it's been an interesting journey of um, growing a business while, I, when I started my business, I transitioned out of a, a job that I had had. I worked in the private sector for about a year. And um, my health was really terrible. It was awful. And I was stressed and my Meniere's was out of control and I was really dizzy, um, probably three or four days a week. And I had an experience where I had a, a, a certain kind of dizzy spell that was really rare for me. Um, but, you know, sort of the world flipped upside down as I was driving home. Um, so I was on a country road and I was able to sort of pull off um, pull the car off the road, but you know, I'm, I couldn't really see all that well. So I mostly just slowly drove into the ditch. Um, and I didn't hurt myself and I didn't hurt the car, but it was a, a real wake up call. And the wake up call was, uh, you got to figure this out. Um, if you're going to run a business, I needed to replace my income. And in order to do that, I felt like I needed to if I was only going to have two or three days a week where I was well, I needed to do everything I could to make sure that was optimum. So that's where sort of that focus on self-care came in because I've seen it, I've experienced it. And, you know, I'd like to say that everything's been good since then, but it's, it's not. Um, this rears its head on a fairly regular basis. And I've been able to figure out, like everyone else on the panel, you know, how do you integrate living with the challenges that we live with and growing a business at the same time? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, Sarah, for, for sharing um, a bit about your story and your background there. Um, it's interesting, right? Because uh, disability, you put that word out there like it is something, but it's not something. It's so many things with so many different um, ways that it can impact people's lives and ways that people have to find to make, um, make it work for them in business and in life. Um, so thanks for, thanks for sharing. Um, thanks for sharing about your, your, um, about your stories as well as your uh, incredible businesses that you've been able to um, succeed in and thrive in. Um, I'm going to, I, I'm going to pose this question to everyone here, but before I do that, I just want to um, encourage the people that are attending here today. If you have any questions for our panelists, um, pop them in the, uh, the chat box and I will, um, I'll try to get to some of your questions during the session and I'll leave a bit of time at the end uh, to address people's questions as well. And if your question is directed particularly to um, a panelist, please indicate that as well. And, um, and um, we'll, we'll get to those questions as we can. So uh, I'll go back to you, Ashley, and, and ask you, and I know some of you have actually kind of touched on this already. I, I think we, we may have an inkling of an idea of, of how you might respond to these, this question, but what would you say would be your motivating factor or factors that actually led you to taking that leap to starting a business? And I'm, I'm guessing in, in some ways it, it was almost a force, or it was a push factor as opposed to a pull factor in that um, employment, regular employment. I know some of you have already mentioned that were, was maybe not an option or, or not a great option for you. Um, but I wonder if you could sort of add to that, Ashley, and. Uh, 
or correct me if I'm wrong. Um, for me, I've always uh, kind of envisioned my own business looking more like I've cr always created my own dis devices, I guess you would call them like, you know, my own key turners or, you know, like a transfer board that you don't have to hold on to because my arms, I don't have the strength to like a transfer board normally is it's just, it's just a long board that you put between like, say your wheelchair and a bed or whatever you're trying to transfer to. But generally speaking, you know, you have to hold the board like it doesn't just stays there so you know people with regular upper body strength can kind of hold themselves or hold the board and like you know a lot of people when they think you know someone in a wheelchair they think paraplegic so they have full upper body strength they can do quite a lot of things um, with that upper body that they have but for me like a lot of times things that were available to purchase just weren't exactly right for me. So like, I don't have a lot of hand strength. So even like the grabbers that are out there, you have to pull that with your fingers. And it seems very simple to most people, but for me to try to pull that trigger is actually quite difficult. So like, for me, like I, I've always found different ways to do things and made my own devices. So I kind of always envisioned that would be more so how I started a business. I had no real interest in <laughs> software in any way. Um, so, but it just so happened that that's, you know, who I met up with and kind of was already into the idea of a business anyways. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I'm very much risk averse. I don't like my whole life, I've, my whole life I've not been able to take chances like that because, you know, you can't just, for me, I had to plan everything. So I can't just show up somewhere and hope for the best, <laughs> you know, like it's either I'm going to get in somewhere or I'm not going to get in somewhere. It's not like a in between, you know, it's, if it has more than like a three inch lip, I mean, my chair alone is 350 pounds. You're not, like, it's not like someone's just going to throw that up over the stairs. Right. So like for me, I've always had to plan everything and everything's had to be very set. Um, so the whole thing of entrepreneurship, it's very much not set and not guaranteed. And that whole concept, I really don't like <laughs> personally, but um, for me, that's what makes this a bit more challenging because I can't, ideally I'd love to be able to kind of give up my day job and go full time into this and put everything into it. But for, for someone like me who, you know, my medication a month, you know, if I didn't have, uh, you know, medication covered. I mean, one of my injections is like, I think it's like $2,000 a month. Like I can't just, you know, kind of quit my job and cause everyone, you know, especially investors are like, well, if you're not serious about this, you do, you know, quit your job and you would go full time. And, and yes, of course my business would probably be better if I could put full time into it. Like I hope to think that I would be helpful. Um, but, um, you know, I can't take that chance of completely giving up that guaranteed income. Um, to do it. So that's actually one of the biggest challenges that from my perspective is that I can't give up a good guaranteed government job with health benefits um, that I need uh, for, you know, a chance. And then obviously as an entrepreneur, you don't really have health benefits unless you go out of your way and buy them on your own. So motivation wise, I kind of always like to invent things because that's just naturally how my mind works. Um, but at the other side of things, you know, it's, it's good in a way for people with disabilities to start their own business because they can make it what works for them. So you're not kind of having to fit in to someone else's, you know, ideal job or, you know, what's offered or anything else. And then you can generally speaking, try to make your own schedule per se that works around, you know, your ups and downs and things like that. But on the other hand, it is a very uncertain type of, um, you know, way to make a living. Um, and for me, like, you know, you always hear of like the stories like, oh, well, you know, I slept on someone's couch like for months on end when I started my business. Like for me, like I need an apartment that's very like, that's more expensive because I need a bathroom that's bigger than the average tiny little bathrooms. And generally speaking, the cheaper apartments are, you know, have stairs and everything else. So when you're looking at accessible wise, like it's not, it's very expensive. <laughs> like, you know, I have to pay for my own snow clearing, like just little things that people don't think of that, you know, all adds up that as you're starting your business, you have that extra money um, to be able to kind of take care of that part of your life. So for me, there's kind of motivations on both sides that I'm kind of torn from one side to the other on that. But, uh, but for me, I think that's, 
my biggest, I guess, motivational factor is just to make something that works for me, but that works for other people. So that way, you know, there needs to be now with technology, there's so much now that people are creating just for fun that actually works quite well for people with disabilities and can be used in so many different realms to make people's lives so much easier. Like I go through my apartment with Alexa and I tell her to turn on my lights all the way through and I don't have to touch anything. I don't have to take my like dressing stick and click on every single light because I can't reach them and like just little things like that. Like, so I've always loved that idea that we can take that kind of technology and make people's lives a bit easier. And if it works for me, then it, I'm sure it would work for someone else. And I always love to hear other people's issues that I can kind of try to solve because not everyone has the mind of troubleshooting things. You know, I'm, I'm lucky that I have that, you know, mindset that I can see solutions into problems that maybe other people don't see and that I can help people out with that. So that's kind of my, I guess. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I get this sense that there's so much more to come from you, Ashley, because your mind is, is just working on what's the next it's thing. It's always what's going. The next thing? <laughs> yeah. I feel like that's a problem with the blood pressure too. So I don't, it's kind of a double-edged sword with the whole mind thing, but yeah. <laughs> oh, Joanne, what would you say was your motivating factor or were there a number of motivating factors? You, you touched on that also, I think in your introduction. But yeah, did I did. I did touch on that, uh, that, you know, it was a need for us as income on uh, to do a side business. But um, in addition to that, um, we also do, uh, respond to our customers um, when they're looking for something in particular. So, um, for instance, our pepper jellies, uh, when we started our first pepper jelly it was in response to a customer from California actually um, who was looking for something very particular um, back then you know 27 years ago here nobody ever heard of pepper jelly we had no internet uh, cookbooks had nothing like that you couldn't research something like that and so the customer uh, was from California and she was looking for something very particular um, and would describe it to us each week at the farmer's market uh, and that's how we developed our first pepper jelly. Um, so that was the start of that line. Uh, so when we um, develop product, uh, it's generally in response to um, something in the marketplace or you know a customer or a need or something like that. And I'd also like to comment, um, Ashley mentioned you know about medications and the cost of them. My husband actually keeps a part-time job. It's a, it's a good part-time job that he actually loves, but um, it does cover <laughs> my medications uh, because I'm in the same boat. Uh, I have a, a couple of medications that are quite expensive, and and so um, you know, you know, covering them, you know, is a, is 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 a concern too. But also, um, so I get really uh, I get chronic migraines that are quite severe. So I also get uh, these headaches that are, they're like a, a sword or a knife that just like come jamming down out of nowhere. Uh, so I often, uh, they try trials sometimes. Uh, so they're not cheap. And, and so, um, uh, you know, in order to cover these kind of medications or to try them out, um, you'll have to be able to pay for them too sometimes. So, um, uh, the uh, and so coverage is uh, a really big deal, you know. And um, like Ashley said, being able to have uh, a way to do that is is very important. And so I think that's something that um, you know um, is always on our minds, or um, it's really important to us. So yeah, so I'll chime in on that too. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go over to Zena. What would you say motivated you to start this business? Well, I was a stay-at-home mom when I lost my eyesight. So I'd say my kids are the biggest motivation factor for the simple fact that, well, A, I want them to think they can do anything in life like everybody wants for their kids. Um, but for me, having the genetic disease, I actually didn't find out until after I had my kids and I passed it on to all three. So 
who knows what's going to happen to them for the future. So I, I really just needed them to know that it doesn't matter what comes your way. If you put your heart and soul into something, you'll never regret trying. Wow. Yeah. That's a really important, really powerful message uh, to share with us and to share with your kids. And I know anyone who is a mother that is, um, you know, it, it is an important thing to be able to convey and not just say, but do. Like it's the action, right? Yeah, yeah, excellent. Sarah, how about yourself? What, what would you say motivated you to start your business? Certainly, it was probably more um, a process of elimination than anything else. Uh, I had worked in the not-for-profit sector for a long time and knew that that wasn't what I wanted anymore. Um, I was pretty burnt out. I worked for another business, uh, dear friends of mine, and part of the question in that was, could I work for someone else after I've been a leader for a long time? And the answer was no. <laughs> there are a lot of, I needed that, you know, that opportunity to do my own thing. And uh, as I said, I worked for a feminist organization for a long time, and I believe that gender equality can solve all of the world's problems. And also living with an illness that at some point could be debilitating. One of the things that I recognized is government works really slowly. Uh, so I could go and work for government and the, and in the places, you know, sort of thinking policy and things like that. Um, I could have a good plan um, in terms of a medical plan, but the speed was not it, it, that I just couldn't quite imagine back in those days, we didn't understand that remote working was a thing that worked really effectively. So to know that I had the pressure of having to drive 45 minutes a day, uh, you know, each way in order to go to a job, I couldn't wrap my head around that. Um, and so I decided to go out on my own because part of it is I may or may not have a lot, uh, you know, a, a really long career. And so I have a lot of things I want to accomplish. And I have, um, I want to do what I can to move toward gender equality. And what I saw observing uh, the not for profit sector, the go government and business, business moves quickly, and you can make those changes quickly. And you don't have to, um, there's lots of challenges, there's no question about that. But I really, I loved the idea of the speed. I love the idea of being able to create my own reality. And it's not always been easy, but I have been able to do that. And I think just on that note of, of um, it's interesting to look at the differences in terms of how we all manage our very different, um, the very different challenges that we face. For me, I, um, prioritized from the very beginning, having a medical plan. So, you know, I pay for that myself. Um, my medications are not that expensive, but I have to buy very expensive hearing aids on the regular and it does help with some of that. So I do think it's just really interesting to see how we all um, solve similar problems in different ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting for you um, talking about how you you made that that uh, decision to go the path of business, and it really feels like you found that niche that works best for you there. And I, you you made that really um, that picture very clear for us to to see that that path just makes all the sense for you. Yeah, it does, and it's not to say that it wasn't. Uh, I I characterize my first year in business as a year long crisis of confidence. It was not easy to go from being an executive director of a women's organization where I was known for my experience, I was known for my expertise, I, I knew what I was doing, no day was the same, but I knew what I was doing every day. And to go into business, and I, I chose to take a, a coaching program out of the U.S. Um, with highly skilled business owners from around the world, many of whom had been in business for years and years. 
And I didn't know what I was doing almost all the time. I needed to figure out really basic things like how do I transfer all of these skills that I created in the not for that I built in the not for profit sector uh, to business. I didn't, I didn't know how to make money. That was not part of what I needed to do. Um, so it was it was really challenging and absolutely rewarding and totally worth it. Yeah. And it's worked. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I think I read in your, your bio that you managed to, it, correct me if I'm wrong, double your, your profits year by year. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 I doubled my revenues every year and uh, a little less than that in 2020, but I was pretty happy with that. So, and that's yeah. what I help other people do. So it's, it's good fun. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So um, the next question I, now I, I'm, I'm recognizing we've only got actually we've only got 11 minutes left, ladies. Um, so um, what I will remind people if you do have questions, post them in the chat. I have lots of questions to get to, so we won't run out. But uh, if there are questions that people have in their minds, please put them up, and I'll, I will get to them. I'm just trying to think now, in interest of time, where do I want to go with my next question? Um, I will, and, and maybe I won't get everyone to respond to all the rest of the questions um, because I would like to, to be able to get to a couple more questions at least. Um, so I'll see who wants to nibble on the, the questions that I'm gonna put forward. Um, so, and as other people have said before, um, I did note uh, an article I read in Forbes, a researcher, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, Kate Caldwell. Um, from the University of Illinois, she indicated that there's plenty of desire in the disability community to build businesses because traditional employment opportunities for people with disabilities are often less than ideal. And I know we've heard that that been said already amongst the panel here. So we know that women um, face barriers to entre entrepreneurship and then layered with that, is the fact that there, there are barriers that you face also with your disability. So I'm wondering if you can share with the audience any supports that you have may, maybe been able to avail of on your journey, uh, entrepreneurship journey, or alternately, if there were supports that you wish you were able to avail of, but you weren't able to find. And I don't know if there, anyway, I'll go for it, Jenna. I had a lot of problems getting my business up and running. Um, I'm a woman, I'm disabled, and I'm an indigenous owned business. So I had all of those things, I don't want to say going against me because to me, they're all strengths. They're not weaknesses, but it's really hard to convey that to other people. So I, I'm sure you can all imagine the kind of looks I would get and the stigma attached to what I'm trying to do. Um, organizations like women in business are incredible for any woman entrepreneur. It doesn't matter if you are disabled or anything, right? They're an amazing start, but I really, really wish there was some sort of organization like that, that was available for people with disabilities, because I really think the world is missing out on so much by not having those opportunities available. Right? These are people who think outside of the box. These are people who can make any situation work for them. Right, So I really, that's my wish for the future is that there is some sort of organization out there that can help those people get started. Right, It doesn't have to be huge monetary contributions, right? Just something to help navigate through the systems. Um, but that's, that's my two cents. Does anybody want to add anything there? I'd like to add uh, just something. Newfoundland is actually quite good. Now, I'm a bit biased because I'm in the tech sector. So, you know, that's a big thing now. So it's, it is a lot easier for, I think, me to get money, just not even having anything to do with the women or anything else. But just the tech sector is kind of a big thing in Newfoundland. So now that there's a lot of uh, supports by the government and things like that. So we've done quite well. But the one thing I think that's missing that I think affects uh, disabled people more uh, than the average person is the fact that a lot of these funding, if not almost all of the funding, um, don't want to give it for co-founders or founders. So 
they will give you supports for hiring other people, but they won't give it to you for actually paying yourself, which, you know, like I like brought up before, it's, you know, it's a huge expense and we're taking a big risk and, you know, we have medication costs and so much other costs that we can't just wing it um, and, you know, skimp and, you know, like as my dad keeps reminding me that he ate lettuce sandwiches when he was so, you know, back in his day. So like, you know, there's only so much that you can skimp on. Like we can't skimp on, I can't skimp on medication. I can't skimp on snow clearing that I can physically get at my house. Like, so like, that's the thing. Like the fact that the funding, there is quite good funding in Newfoundland, but the fact that a lot of it cannot be used towards the actual founders creating the business in the first place is a major problem because there's a big gap between when you first start and before you can actually take home any money. And that time frame is, is like vital. Um, and if you can't wait that out, I mean, you know, if I didn't have my other job, I would not be able to be where like continue. Right. Like, so like, that's, that's a big, I think miss is that they also need to look at that and maybe, I don't know, supporting disabled people with some sort of medical plan and, and helping them out with those costs in the meantime. Um, because I know there's a huge gap, even when I was transferred for like transitioning from university to a job, um, I went from not making much money to making decent money, but then they completely cut me off from any funding for like my wheelchair is like over $20,000. You know, I have to buy that every five years. My van costs $80,000. Like who in their right mind can pay for that when, you know, at any time in their life, actually, like, you know, I don't generally have $20,000 laying around, you know, just for extras. So, you know, that I think they really need to take into consideration, like that side of things that that is a major factor that that's honestly why a lot of disabled people don't even have an opportunity to even get a job because they can't give up all these supports to even be able to do it. You know why it's almost stupid for me to work as much as I'm working, you know, when I could not work and get all my medication funded, all my, you know, equipment funded, my van, fund, like I could have all of it and just sit home and do nothing, but that's not who I am. But like, they make it that that's the easier route, you know, and that's not, yeah. and that's the same with like building a business. Like that's the same type of challenges for that too. Yeah. 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 Um, anyone else want to add to that? Joanne? I'm not sure if I should almost say this, but I think I'm going to hear. Um, so 16 years ago, when I did have my accident, uh, I, I looked for everything. I, uh, you know, uh, so in Nova Scotia, we did have a, a, a disabled uh, or disability association. Um, and I did go to them and they were quite adamant that uh, I should close my business um, and not even think about uh, continuing or um, uh, because with a brain injury, that's something that, uh, um, you know, with, with what I'd been diagnosed with, it's not something that I should even think about. Uh, um, it, it's hard for me to say this, um, that I should, um, you know, even think about uh, being in business or continuing in business. I should close the doors um uh, sell my business if it was possible um and those were such hard words to hear uh they were extremely hard uh i you know i went to them for help um they were extremely hard words to hear and and i think they thought they were helping me uh and I mean, I, I certainly sat down and really considered the prospect, really looked at it hard, sat down with a few other people, you know, for weeks afterwards, you know, um, even, you know, in the state I was in, like, um, got people in to really, you know, look hard at that possibility, um, you know, uh, but uh, um, like I said, you know, it was their income, it was their, you know, it was their family living and uh, we had no place else to go, but, uh, you know, so, um, uh, but uh, I, I, we remember that day, you know, very clearly, um, like, um, you know, you expect that to be the place you go for help, um, that to be the association you go for help because, um, 
uh, they're, they're no longer around. Um, uh, they closed a number of years ago. But uh, so I guess, you know, when you wish for an association to be around, I guess, and if you wish for them to be recreated, um, you might want to wish for them to have a mandate or a certain mandate and, you know, of what they would be. This might be, you know, my caution when I say this. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, I, and I'm sure I, I, there wouldn't have been any malice in, in, in what um, they conveyed to you. No. They, that would have been the it thought. It wasn't malice. Have, right. Right. But it wasn't helpful. No. Yeah. 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 Um, I have two minutes left, but I do want to put a, a quick question out there to see if anyone nibbles on it. Um, I'm wondering about mentors. Have, have you had any mentors that uh, along the way that have helped you? And if so, what was helpful about that mentorship? Okay, Sarah. I have had so many mentors. I, I think what is helpful about mentorship is um, mentors are there to give you tea and sympathy when you're having a hard day, cheer you on, and give you a kick in the butt when you need it. And I think um, business is really lonely. And if you can find people to share that journey with you, it will pay off in spades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, thanks everyone. Okay, well that, I told you the hour was gonna go by really fast and it went by really fast for me. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from all of you, your, all your perspectives. It was um, very eye-opening and uh, thought-provoking. And so again, a, a massive thank you, Ashley, Jenna, Sarah, and Joanne for being with us today. Um, to our attendees here today, I encourage you, please, we're going to share an evaluation after this session. Uh, please uh, let us know what you think, uh, how we can make improvements. Maybe we need an hour and a half. <laughs> um, and the other thing I will do is also share this chat um, with all the attendees today, because I know there's a lot of sharing that happened in the chat. And I'll share that with all the panelists today, as well as all the attendees. So thanks again, everyone. Take care. All the best.